Welcome, welcome, welcome to Boss Radio Live. Welcome to Boss Radio Live. Live. This is your host, NJ. Uh, so glad that you all are joining me. Today, we will have an amazing guest. We will have Kim Rahar on the line with us today. Uh, really excited to have Kim with us. Uh, Kim is an amazing speaker. She is an MS advocate, and Kim is a uh, weightlifting champion. So we're going to hear more about that. Um, that's going to be a very interesting story. So really can't wait to hear that. Make sure you all share the episode. Make sure you share today's episode. Um, and in case you have never heard of Kim, Here's a little bit more about her. Kim Rahir, a speaker, MS advocate, and weightlifting champion. Once a journalist, after receiving a devastating diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or MS over 11 years ago, Kim fell into a place of darkness, but she refused to remain there. She literally muscled her way out of illness and into a weightlifting championship. She now helps women in their midlife who are dealing with a host of health symptoms by building muscle and strength. Kim believes that a focus on strengthening muscle can boost confidence and be a powerful driver of self-care and empowerment because it puts you in a spirit of building and nurturing. Kim encourages women to reactivate muscle and tap into an abundant source of vitality. So everybody, welcome Kim Rahar to the show. And Kim, I think I'm saying your name wrong. So please correct me. Can you hear me, Kim? <laughs> I can hear you. It's not a big deal. It's Rahir. It's a weird Rahir. name. It's from my Belgian <laughs> Belgian husband because I'm I'm a good old German, you know. It's not a very German name, but it's okay. Kim is fine and that's easy to say. Thanks for having me, Michelle. Kim Rahir. Yes. So we're going to get that right. So Kel, welcome to the show. I'm so um, excited to have you on the show. One, because like our time zones are completely different. So it was yes. really funny even getting to this point that, that you are on the show with us. So thank you for uh, working with me through that. Um, so yes, glad to have you on. Yeah, it's also absolutely amazing, right, that we can sort of talk like this and mm -hmm. um, connect across the ocean, different continents and everything. Um, I find that very, very inspiring and, and really one of the really nice sides of technology. Yes, and I really wanted to have you on because of the topic that you're going to be speaking about today for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is your totally amazing journey that we're going to get into, right? Um, but also just to speak about more about um, MS as well. Um, and so let's jump right into that. I, I really would like to jump right into that and talk about, let's talk about your journey um, and how you got from being in a wheelchair to being a weightlifting champion. So let's talk about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and if you said mus- muscular, it's probably because of my story. I'm all about muscle. I'm, I'm crazy about muscle, and I think muscle will uh, could can save our health, improve our health for for everybody. So, okay. you're probably already quite quite um, indoctrinated by just reading about me and what I what I share all the time. So, when I was I was diagnosed with MS in 2013, but I have quite a history before that. Um, I had an autoimmune uh, disorder, which is a one-off that was I had in 2008 already. Um, it comes and it goes. It's, it's, it has a, a difficult name. It's called the syndrome Guillain-Barré. It was named after the French doctors who discovered it. And it knocked me for six from one day to the next, from literally from one day to the next. I was picking up my kids from school and I was seeing double and I knew I had to see a doctor, um, sent me to the hospital. I spent six weeks in hospital and um, you know, my eyes were crossed and I noticed that my legs were sort of leaving me. I lost the control of my legs. And after three weeks in hospital, I was paralyzed from the hips downward. I could not wiggle a toe, which was so, so scary. Um, and they gave me all kinds of treatments and, and one of them must have worked because I could sort of gain the use of my legs back. The scary part was actually that they didn't really know what was going on with me because, the, you know, the, the double vision is like sort of one syndrome and then the paralysis is another syndrome. It was very interesting to find myself in hospital wishing for a diagnosis. I mean, something that you would, in a normal life you would never say, oh, my God, please let it be something. Um, but you get so scared with the uncertainty that you think, no, let let it be, you know, give me some clarity, give me some answers. But it took months and months until they decided it was this one-off syndrome. So um took me like six months to learn walking again. I just I gained sensitivity back in my in my legs. Um still felt weird sometimes, but I was getting better. Got treatment, and then I was told that I was cured, that this was a one-off and it would never come back. And then two years later, I felt my left hand going numb. And I knew from the sensation that something was wrong. Went to the doctor again. And they said, yeah, this time it's different. This time it's an attack of your immune system on the white matter in your nerves. And um, it's MS. And that was like a really low blow. Because the first experience had already been quite traumatic. Just imagine three small kids at home you have a full-time job, you know, you're like really living life to the fullest and then you're out from one day to the next. And then after three weeks, you can't even go to the toilet on your own. Um, that was quite traumatizing and dehumanizing, actually. And then I had been given that clean bill of health and I thought, yes, 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 now I'm going to make the most of life. And then bang, the second blow, I had MS. And that meant also lifelong treatment, which I, of course, um, fought the doctor because I didn't want it. I, I thought, no, I just sort of got my power back after not being able to walk and being in like a vegetable in the hospital. And now, you know, I'm going to be hooked up to like lifelong treatment with medication. I didn't want that. And I, I fought with the doctor for close to an hour and he was not used to this at all. He was just sort of writing down the prescription, wanted to send me on my way. Um, when I said, um, hang on, can we please talk about this? Um, but I had to give in, you know, they scare the living daylights out of you. So, you know, if it's MS, if, you know, anything, anything can happen. You could end up in a wheelchair. You could end up blind. You know, it's it can sort of attack any part of your nervous system. So I had to start injecting myself. But what I did, I mean, I asked him and about exercise and his answer was not very clear. He said something like, yeah, you can exercise, but be careful. But I talked to a nurse, the one who taught me how to inject myself, and she said exercise is great for MS. It makes you fatigue resistant, um, and fatigue is a big problem for MS patients. So, and I just had my left hand that is numb to this day, by the way. Um, otherwise, I, you know, I was mobile. I could walk. I could move normally, which I really appreciated after that hospital experience. And I decided I was going to go to the gym and I was going to get insanely strong. I cannot tell you where this urge came from. I think it was because of this 
powerlessness in the hospital because of this sense of betrayal that you're not really, you can't really trust your body because it's doing weird things to itself. And I think that's where this came from. And I started training. I started lifting heavy. I got this book from the guys. I think we're one of the first uh, that said women should lift heavy too. Ditch the pink dumbbells and lift heavy. And I I got strong so fast. I got better so fast. I had lost reflexes, you know, in the in in the inflammation in the nerves and everything. That doctors had told me those reflexes they will never come back, and they then they did. And the most uh, important change was my mental health because I became so confident, so so positive, so so optimistic. Just by lifting, by lifting heavy stuff and and feeling strong, um, and then after a few years of injecting myself, I you know we had moved. I I live in Spain now. I had a Spanish neurologist who saw me, and he said, "You you know, if you want to, you can stop your treatment." And I said, "Hell yes, I want to." That was seven years ago. And I've been without treatment and without relapse ever since. That was also the time when I thought maybe, just maybe I'm onto something. Not a cure for a mess, but um, a very simple protocol that can sort of lift you out of, of, of dark and low times and, and make you feel so much better. And I think the mental health then reflects on your physical health and it becomes a virtuous cycle. Wow. <laughs> so you you said a lot and so I want to I want to dig into different parts of that because let's talk about the mindset which I think um listening to your story was very important. So from the moment that you got diagnosed to that moment where you started, you know, you were talking about reading and then you were talking about what you what you were thinking as you began to work out. What was that mindset change that happened there? What what um, was what was it at the beginning and what what did it shift to? Yeah. When I think about the days and weeks when I was first diagnosed, the word that always comes to my mind is darkness actually. It was also winter, which plays a role, 100%, but it felt very dark. Um, you know, I've, I was never a person who had a very precise plan for the future. You know, like some people that say, oh, with 25, I want to get married and with, oh, I want a house and I want kids and they have this precise plan. I'd never had this. But still, uh, I had an idea of, you know, who I wanted to be, how I wanted to to live and when you get a diagnosis like this, is this whole idea is just replaced with a big question mark. Uh, and it's very, very scary and dark. And you just, with MS, you don't know where you're going. You know, it's different for every single patient. And I realized that if I looked at the big picture and if I thought, even thoughts about the future, they would just scare me to death because it was so uncertain, so unclear. And you can easily get scared and worked up about stuff, you know, that's not happened. And that might never happen. But you're just imagining things that, you know, that, that could happen to your body. And and this kind of fear also paralyzes you because you, you know, then think, oh, my God, is this worth doing? Because I don't even know if I, I'll be able to do it next week. So I decided that I was just going to focus on every single day, just one day at a time. There was a bit of denial in this too, but I think it was very healthy for me. I just didn't want to see what was coming. I was going to spend as much time, as much quality time with my three kids as I could. I wanted to be with them. I wanted to to have fun with them, to do things with them. Um, and I was just going to focus on what can I do on this day? What can I do today? Because today is here and we can deal with it and I can handle things. And depending on how I how I felt, uh, and I got better so quickly that it was 
it became easier and easier to just look at the day and think, oh, I can do this. I can do that. And th I think that's a big shift in my mindset when I realized there's absolutely no benefit in thinking about the future. Just focus on what you can do today and what you can do now. Oh, that's a great point, actually. Um, and I think that keeps you from going into that unknown space that you were talking about, wondering about the unknown. So, and you even um, hit on the mental health piece, um, which that's like a, a passion of mine for us to really um, be mindful of like our mental state where we really are and, and taking care of ourselves, um, our mental health. Uh, and so for yourself, you were talking about how you you believe the exercise really helped that. Um, but did, were you doing anything else at that time as well, as far as your mental health was concerned? Yes. Yes, I, I, I discovered meditation. I started meditating. Um, I used, uh, still use today. I mean, I've been doing this for, for 13 years now, I think. Or maybe, no, not that. Anyway. For a long time, uh, uh, an app called Headspace. At the beginning, it was just like one English guy, and I think now it's like a huge global thing. And they've evolved and evolved and evolved. And it, yeah, it helped me a lot, especially this focusing on the present. And um, this is not my uh, my idea. I don't know where I heard it, but I heard someone say that you know our mind is all the time traveling in a time machine. You know, we're always going back and forth and thinking, oh, this happened. And, oh, will this happen? Or what's going to happen? And, oh, I remember when that happened. So our mind is always like really in this crazy time machine, whereas our our body only really has the, the here and now. So when we sort of connect with our body, when we focus in our mind on what's going on in my body, I'm just, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm breathing, stuff like this. Um, we can bring the mind back to the present. It's actually much simpler as many people think many people have this idea of meditation is like this very uh, elaborate thing where you have to sort of get into a trance and stuff it's not not that at all it's just you're just bringing your mind back to the presence of your body and you watch your breath and it's incredibly beneficial so that helped me a lot with this mindset shift to to like trying and 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 really live just what's now and, and not worry too much about tomorrow excellent Yes, I love that. I love it. Okay, awesome. So now let's get on to this this weightlifting because I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. So um, now you you don't only do this for yourself, but you you help people uh, with weightlifting and building muscle. So tell us about that, and and tell us about how you became a champion. Uh, at yeah. This so, as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I went to commercial gyms and I lifted in a style that is basically called power lifting. So you know you do deadlifts and squats and bench presses and stuff like that. Um, and we moved to Spain, um, and I always signed up for the gym first to make friends to you know sort of get my bearings. And I worked with a personal trainer, and one day he said would you like to try Olympic weightlifting? Uh, and I said, hmm, would I like to try Olympic weightlifting? I had this memory of my dad and I watching the Olympic Games when I was a kid. And those were like very overweight men, hairy and weird, weird leotards, lifting barbells <laughs> overhead. That was that was my memory of this. But I thought, yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah, let's give that a shot. And I tried it. I sucked at it. Like it's incredibly difficult. And I, but I was hooked because it is, it takes your everything. When it comes to mindfulness and being present, you cannot approach that bar and think about what I'm, am I going to cook for dinner? Because then it's not going to, it's not going to happen. You really need full focus because it's physical strength and it's also technique. And that's, it's, 
something that I love, which is lifelong learning. You can, you never, you know, it's not like you nail a lift and then you're always going to do it in the same way. It never comes out the same way because it's explosive. So, you know, depending on how well you slept, you slept or how your neurons are firing on that day, you know, it might work, might not work. I loved it so much that I left the commercial gym and joined the pure weightlifting club. And after two weeks of training with them, they said, hey, Kim, uh, great that you're training with us. Do you want to compete? And I said something at the time that I would never say today, but I said, compete? Do you know how old I am? Because I was 55. And they said, we don't care. And I love that. And I said, okay, why not? Let's try that. And I remember my very first competition that was a local meet. I I thought I was going to cry all the time, not because I was sad or scared or nervous. It was just the emotion was so powerful. All the stuff that you go through, it's like scary and exhilarating and exciting and inspiring and adrenaline, you know, rushing through your body. And and then you step out on that platform and all the eyes are on you. And it was, I, you really feel yourself live when you do that. You feel so alive. So I've been competing ever since, like for five years now. Um, and what I do with my clients um, is strength training. So, you know, they don't have to throw barbells around. That would be, um, that would be a bit crazy. Um, actually, my, my real, what I call my zone of genius is actually that I can get um, I can get you to strength train no matter where you are at. Because we all have this idea, oh, my God, I have to go to the gym and I have to pump iron or I have to do these weird machines. And um, and that's absolutely not the case. I can, you know, build a program for you that takes you 15 minutes a day that you do at home in your pajamas if you want to. Um, and that will get you stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is a really important aspect because I work mainly with women who are in their 40s and beyond. And the idea of, you know, signing up for a gym and spending an hour training, it's it's totally uh, unrealistic for them. And if you can just do this first thing in the morning, quickly, 15 minutes, and you're done, then it becomes doable. It becomes accessible. It becomes less intimidating and then with the results that you're getting and you're going to get them like within two weeks, it sometimes it, it goes so fast. Um, you create that virtuous cycle, that momentum where you realize, oh, I'm doing just a very short routine, but it's giving me big results. So that's great. Let's let's keep doing that. And um, this sort of foot in the door where you have to start doing something and making that as easy as possible, as accessible as possible, as you know, short and simple as possible. I think that's that's the way um, we can help people get started. People that uh, otherwise would think, oh my God, this is too much. I have so much on my plate. This is too much for me. So make it small, make it doable and focus on what you can do in the moment and do that and then go from there. Awesome. Now I heard you say something, Kim, and you said, that you told the the people at the, in the powerlifting club that you you were too old, and I heard you say an age that I just I'm not I'm not even believing right now, um, because you said something about fifty five, I think you said, and then you started talking about how that was so many years ago. Um, so <laughs> number one, you look great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> but the other thing I want to say then is. Is what because because you concentrate, but I'm sure that's not your sole focus. But I know you concentrate on people who are like in midlife. But what would you say if someone's saying that same thing that you said, like, "Oh, I'm too old to start this," or you know, because you know I'm right around there. I'm, <laughs> I'm like right in that age that you're talking about. Um, and so, you know, what what would you say to someone who said that? Well, I know from my own experience that it's never too late. And I think, I mean, that's also the reason why I keep sharing my story, because I definitely was at a point in my life where I didn't even know if I was going to be able to walk again. Um, and life has shown me that it's never too late. 
we just need to move away from thoughts about what we should be able to do or, you know, what we would like to be able to do or what everybody else does and focus on just one thing. What can you do today? I, I don't care. You're 55, you're 92, you're 110. What can you do today? We feel, we figure that out. And if that's maybe just a little wall push-up or for like a really old person, it could just be getting, learning to get up, uh, you know, out of a chair or something like this. We just figure out what can you do today and we start from there and we build from there. So we let go of all all ideas and stereotypes and, and shoulds, you know, shoulds are never helpful um, and focus on whatever it is that we can do. And um, I wasn't raised in this mindset. I was very much raised uh, in a sort of all or nothing uh, thinking, like, if, you know, if it wasn't perfect, then it was not really worth it. And through my experience, I know, well, you know, you have dodgy knees, okay, we work around that. You have a stiff shoulder, we do something else. We look after your entire body. We sort of circumvent the problems. Um, but anybody can do something something today. And the most important part, and that's also why I have this 15-minute concept, the most important part is to actually do it. Because that's, you know, most people know what to do. Most people know that they should go for walks and that they should eat vegetables and that they should probably do come some kind of resistance training. That's not difficult. The information is everywhere. But how do you actually do that? And that's where, you know, people need help to get started and then to realize, oh, I can actually do this. That's fine. Wow. That's awesome. And thank you for that that extra motivation because we do kind of get in our heads and we're thinking, because, you know, I have the age and the dodgy knees. So <laughs> I, have a, I have a couple of those issues going on. So thank you personally for that. Um, so... What is the what is the best way? And I think you even said it, but if you wanted to expand on that a little more, because you said, what can you do today? Um, so is that what you would say would be the best way to think about how to get started in all of this? Or do you want to give some more information about how someone can just just how can they just get started? What can they do? If you have a pretty good idea of you know, where you are at. If you don't have this, uh, the, this thinking, oh my God, I, my knees, they are achy, I can't do anything. Um, you can start with gentle movements. Uh, you can start by walking more. You can uh, start by doing some calisthenics, like just body weight exercises. And it could be, you know, sitting down, getting up from a chair uh, repeatedly, just to work your muscles a little bit. Um, the best way, if you you know, if you want to be serious and if you want to be safe, is you to have someone assess you, uh, look at how you move, um, and then you know tell you you know what would be a great point for you to start. Um, but if you're just listening now and and you're thinking, hmm, what could I do right now? No, take a walk around the block, uh, have a glass of water, um, maybe just get down on the floor and get back up. Do that five times. Um, that's already something that will sort of take you out of this sedentary lifestyle that most of us are actually forced into. It's not like, yes, we are inherently not lazy, but we don't really want to expend our energy because mankind has evolved, you know, needing to save energy, to eat as much as we can and to move as little as possible in order to just conserve the, the energy that was scarce. And now we live in an environment where uh, we're surrounded by food all the time. Food is pushed on us all the time. And we actually, uh, this is something that I say very seriously, I think we have to fight for our right to move because if we don't fight, if we don't insist, it's not happening. We can spend all day sitting do our work sitting, then, you know, food is delivered to our doorstep and entertainment is in our home. We stream it into our living room. So if we do not uh, fight, if we're not deliberate, you know, 
we're not going to move. It's not going to be given to us. We really have to be, have to fight. So if you work from home or even if you're just, you know, sitting watching a show in the evening, why not, you know, get up from the sofa, get down on the floor and get back up and do that five times. You'll be out of breath, I promise. And you will become aware of all kinds of bodily muscular functions that have been dormant and that you want to wake up. Wow. And and Kim, throughout your journey that you've had, what do you think is the most important thing that you've learned? I think the one, the, the, the thought that I shared before, that you must focus on what you can do now. So never, I mean, it still happens sometimes, but mostly never ask, why did this happen? Who's to blame for this? Um, why does this happen to me? You know, forget all those questions. Ask only one question. What can I do now about this? That's all you need. And I, I would have raised my kids differently if I had been through all this before, because I remember when they were smaller, before I had all this, this um, experience, this brush with illness, I would also, you know, when something went wrong, I would also ask, who did this? You know, who, who did this? Who left the hmm on the floor and who? Did... Now I will, would only ask, no, what can we do now? You know, to about this situation, about what's going on. What can I do now? And when you're raising kids, it could also be that you call one of the kids and say, you pick this up. But, you know, don't waste time thinking about why things happen and is it really fair and who's to blame. This is a big one. We always want to blame someone mm -hmm. instead of taking charge of the situation at hand and then you know, move forward, not look backward. That's a really big one, Kim. I hope everyone is listening to that because uh, what you said, and I'm glad you went into the example with your kids, because that immediately shows you how you can apply that outside of just, you know, being sick or something like that. But that can apply across everything we do, because I think we do get stuck sometimes in a place of... Um, like a pity party we mm -hmm. take and and you know there there's a saying like okay take a moment to you know cry about it or you know be sad but then get moving figure yeah. out you know how to how we're going to solve the problem how we're going to so I think it's it's similar to that we really can't we just don't have the time to waste why waste the time on just being stuck in the past of what happened, why it happened, who's to blame for. <laughs> yeah. so I, that's a really, no, that is a really good one. I love that point. That point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and besides that, that amazing point that, that you've given our listeners, if they don't hear anything else today, I hope they, they hear that. <laughs> um, but is, is there, you know, just an overall thing you want to leave them with today is where we're wrapping up. I can't believe it's been uh, a whole half an hour that we've been talking already, <laughs> but it, it always goes fast, especially when there's a good discussion. But, you know, um, even if it's if it's something specific to multiple sclerosis um, itself, but, you know, and the people who have it, uh, but. Is there something overall that you'd like to leave the listeners with today? Yeah, well, the big one is the one when uh, that I said before. Ask yourself always, you know, what can I do now? Um, there's another thought that I um, think can be very helpful because we often, especially women, we often think, you know, the problem is all inside us. It's it's our personality, our character, our nature. Um, uh, that is somehow not right, not adequate, not up to it. Um, and we, we think that we need a new mindset. If we had only this different mindset, if only we were motivated, if only were this person, this sort of disciplined person or this uh, active person, um, you know, then we could do all these things that we want to do. Um, and I, 
I want to encourage everybody to, to turn this mind over matter thinking around just for an experiment and try to go matter over mind. Uh, you know, do the things that the disciplined person would do. Like do just one thing that that the person you want to be would do and then do it again and do it again. And I think by doing, you know, you become the person with that mindset. It's not something that switches in your brain and then all of a sudden you do all the things. No, you do the things first. It can be messy. It can be irregular. It can be not what you think it should be, but you're doing something and that's how you evolve into that person you want to be. And it's so much more accessible and so much more specific and, and, and concrete than imagining that you would need some kind of personality to, to become the person you want to be. No, just do stuff, you know, do small things, anything, but do stuff and then you, you can become the person who does this kind of stuff. Okay. I say that's a great place to end this on. So think about what what can you do today? Don't worry about what happened yesterday and then just do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Do yeah. it. Don't waste time. Um, so thank you so much, Kim. And I know um, if folks want to learn more about you, that you you have a website as well. Um, that they can go to. Is there anything specific you want you want to tell us about your website? Yeah, there's a there's a free um, strength and health assessment on there. You know what I said before when you want to find out where you at. You know if you want to go from A to B, you first want to know which is my point A, um, and you can take that on there. It will tell you a little bit about how your how your physical strength and your your mental strength sort of tie into your day-to-day -day life. So it's not an assessment where I say, how many push-ups can you do? It's more like, you know, how do you tie your shoes, stuff like that. And once you've taken that, um, you know, I give you a few pointers on where you can start, what you could start doing, um, you know, what would be a good point of entry for you to, to become stronger and leaner and happier. Well, thank you. So you guys go to the website, check out that assessment and get started. Get started. Yes. Thank you, Kim, so much for uh, being an inspiration. Definitely. Because uh, you are. Um, and thank you for being on the show today. It was really great having you. Thanks for having me, NJ. I had a great time. Awesome. Well, you guys, this is another great episode. I thank my guest, Kim Rahir. We're saying your name correctly now. <laughs> I thank my guest, Kim Rahir, for being on the show today. It was a really great show. Make sure you share the episode. Um, catch us every second and fourth Friday. Um, we'll be here. And I can't wait to see you guys the next time. Thank you so much once again, Kim. Thanks. All right, you guys. We'll see you again. And uh, until next time, you guys know what I always say. Be boss.